Yeah. Okay, thanks for having me again. Uh, 14 days ago, we had a basic introduction into Borg, and this time we will dive a bit deeper and also address some frequently asked questions that come up again and again. So uh, I need to switch to my slides. Yep. Uh, first, some words about some internals of Boric, uh, how the architecture is and how the data structures in memory and on disk look like. Uh, there are way more details in our docs, but I just show you some of the interesting stuff. So uh, usually you use Boric from the command line. This is basically the, the top. Uh, Box here, so you use bulk commands like, like bulk create, bulk extract, and so on. So this is the uppermost user-facing uh, layer. And internally in bulk, there are some uh, routines like iterate over items or representation of an item. Basically, an item is is basically a file, a directory, a symlink, a hard link, or something. And uh, so there is this this data access layer, uh, rather abstract. Uh, then there is a compression uh, layer that does all sorts of compression, like LZ4 or LZMA or Zlib or Z standard. Uh, then there is encryption layer, which also does authentication. So it's authenticated encryption, and all this stuff happens in the bulk client. So this is basically the, the top half of this. And also the remote repository code is also still in the bulk client. So bulk can either operate locally. This is basically the lower left part. Then you basically have the same bulk process directly talking to a repository, which is just a directory with a the Borg repository files inside. And the other way is uh, you have a remote repository. Then there is basically a layer uh, of remote procedural calling inside Borg. So on the client side, there is this remote repository class in Python that uses SSH the client as a transport to transport basically uh, standard in and standard out over the SSH pipe. On the other side, on the remote machine, there is the SSH daemon. And connected to that daemon, there is just this Borg self uh, process. And this Borg self process basically does exactly the same thing as the local Borg would do if you don't use a remote repository. So it's basically just one Borg talking to the other Borg over an SSH uh, channel. Uh, so this is quite uh, easy to implement. The only problematic thing here is um, there is no requirement that you use the same Borg version remotely and locally. So um, it's a good idea to use a similar version, but you can even have a rather old Borg version on the repository side, on the remote repository, and use the latest client locally. So usually it works because there is some compatibility code in this remote repository class. So this is how it works on a high level. Um, some words about the encryption. Uh, you know, Borg is basically cutting input files into pieces, into so-called chunks. So we start here from a, a data chunk, basically. It's just a piece of content data from a file. And uh, the first thing it does, uh, it's computing a, a Mac. You see ID Mac here on the left. Uh, Mac means uh, message authentication code. And basically, this is the ID of that plain text data chunk. So we use a key value store. Basically, this ID is the key to the key value store. And it's computed over the plain text. This is important. Uh, then the plain text is compressed. You can choose it by command line argument which compressor you want to use. Uh, 
uh, the result is this compressed chunk. And there is also a type byte which just uh, tells uh, which compression was used. So it's easier to decompress afterwards. Uh, then after it's compressed, uh, we use AES256 in counter mode to encrypt it. And this will be basically this encrypted payload you see at the uh, lower right. And because we want to have uh, authenticated encryption, we uh, just put this payload and this uh, initialization vector. This is basically the counter of the counter mode. So it just starts from zero at some time and then just increments all the time. And we just store the payload and this initialization vector. And then we compute another message authentication code over this encrypted content and over the initialization vector and store it additionally. Uh, see the lower left as a message authentication code for this whole piece of data. And also we store another type byte which tells uh, which kind of uh, encryption and uh, repository or uh, home file key we use. So this is how it works. Uh, important is that you first encrypt and then as the last step basically you authenticate with this MAC. Um, also important is that the ID MAC, see uh, upper left, the ID MAC is computed over plain text. So it does not matter what compressor you use, it will always be the same ID because compression is done afterwards. So the IDs don't change if you change the compression of the data. So uh, this is how the repository looks inside on a, on a logical level, basically. Uh, you see at the lower end of the graphics, there is a lot of chunks. This is basically uh, mostly the content data, all your content in your files cut into these chunks. Uh, if you have small files, a file is basically one chunk. If it's only one kilobyte or something, it will be just one chunk. But if you have a file of say 100 gigabytes or so, uh, it will likely result in uh, thousands of chunks or 100,000 even. So this is basically your encrypted data. And then you see, you see there are pointers pointing uh, to this content. So a file is basically represented as uh, some metadata information. This is not shown here. And uh, the content of the file is just a lot of pointers pointing to all the chunks you need to reassemble the file to put it together again. And these, um, these files are discovered uh, by a recursion through the file system. And then basically what Borg does, it creates a, a metadata stream. So from the bottom, the, the second layer here in this graphics, this directory file, 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 file stuff, uh, this is basically a, a metadata stream, just one file after the other, similar like Tar is doing it. Uh, just the content is not in between the metadata, but it's externally stored in these chunks. And the Borg archive, again, is just pointing to such a metadata stream. So uh, like a tar archive contains one file after the other, a Borg archive is also just a stream. And the archive basically has just some pointers pointing to this stuff. And then of course you need some sort of uh, master directory. This is called manifest in Borg. Uh, this is basically the list of all archives uh, that exist in your repository. So it's all basically pointers to some chunk ID. And uh, a nice thing uh, to note is not only your content is cut into chunks and deduplicated, uh, the metadata stream is also cut into chunks and deduplicated. So for example, if you back up a directory that has 10,000 files inside and this directory does not change, then the metadata stream 
in your next backup will be the same as the metadata stream in your current backup. And then this metadata chunk will also be deduplicated because the content was the same. Uh, the manifest is easy to discover in the repository. It has a fixed ID of just zero. So it's all zero bits, uh, 256 bits of zero. Uh, so basically that is kind of artificial, but because usually the key is just a hash over the content, but not in that case, because you have to find it somehow. So it's just fixed at one place. Uh, are there questions about this stuff? Or did it get clear enough? Well, there's one question of Ronnie in the chat. Is the okay. chunk size optimized for block size? Uh, the chunk so, size is dynamic. I will get uh, to this a bit later in the slides. Uh, but basically, you soon will have a choice to either use uh, fixed chunks, whatever you want, or to use this uh, content-defined chunking, but we will get to that. Okay, let's see. I have a look in the chat. Uh, yeah, all, all the chunking, all the encryption, all the compression is all done on the client side. So basically, the Borg self side is only uh, for storing away this stuff. So it's it's just putting it in the file system and arranging it in some files. Uh, we'll see that later also. Okay, let's continue. Uh, this is basically uh, what you have in the repository. And here is a specific example of what happens if you call bulk compact. This will be a new command in bulk 1.2. In uh, earlier Borg versions, you basically had an internal um, method called compact segments. And basically it was always executed after the commit. And uh, if you did a, some write operation to the repository, it always did the compact segments at the end. But in future, we'll, you will have more control about when this is uh, used. This is basically the, the garbage collection of Borg. And in this graphics, you see how it works. We start at the top. Uh, this, this small print text at the left, I'm not sure if you can read it. It basically just reads segment one at the top and segment two below it. And uh, then it goes on to segment three in the uh, further process. So uh, let's start at the top. Uh, Borg basically puts all his stuff in the repository into so-called segment files. It's just a normal file in the file system. It just has a number, number zero, number one, number two. It just always increments that number. And it's just a normal file. And it starts with, with a magic. The magic is called Borg segment. So you can basically recognize this kind of files. And then um, we have a, a log-like structure. Log-like means always append at the end and do not modify stuff that is in the in the that was already written so we only write at the end or we delete stuff we never modify stuff in place so and we have a key value store the keys are the the letters here so a b c and f are the keys and uh, one two five seven and so on the numbers are basically an, an example for the value for the content so here we have one put operation to the key value store that writes a one at address A. So the key is A, the value is one. Then it writes value two at address B, value five at address C and so on. And this just gets appended into this segment file and segment files can get whatever 500 megabytes long or so. It's just to have not uh, huge files, but somehow limited file size and so this is basically what a client does it just puts new stuff into a key value store and sometimes of course you also want to delete for example an old archive you don't need anymore then there will also be delete commands appended to these files 
So it will just tell delete A. It will not just remove this A here because we never modify old data. It will just append a delete command basically. And you can also, of course, uh, supersede something. So here you see in green, it puts a new C value. Here C was five and here C will be seven. And so there was just a lot of puts and deletes. And if it's finished, it will append a commit at the end of the file. So basically, if you see this commit, you see, okay, this was a place where something was finished. We are now in a defined state. We are finished. Everything was written to disk. Everything was synced to, to disk. If it's just before the commit, it will uh, issue some sync commands and then write this commit data and sync again and sync the directory. So it will uh, do quite a lot to make sure that everything is on disk. And for example, if your system crashes before the commit, there is no problem because it will notice that something was not finished here. And if it crashes after the commit, because we did this lots of syncing, if your system is working correctly, if the commit is there, we also know everything else is there. So then we will continue with the second uh, thing here. So basically then you call bulk compact. What it will then do, it, it will start a new segment. There is only this magic Borg segment inside and nothing else yet. And, and then it will read through the old data and just basically look, what do we still need? So of course we need this put B equals two uh, because it's not deleted and it was also not replaced by a new value. So we keep this and write it to the new segment. Uh, then we come to C, and here you see the old C value of 5 was superseded by a new value of C equals 7, and Bolt will notice this. It has an index, so it will notice what the current uh, value is, and so it will just skip this 5 value because it's superseded. Then it will continue with F and append F here because it was not deleted and not superseded. Then it will get to the uh, to the new C value of seven and append that. And this D value, it will also append that because it's all stuff we still need. It was not deleted, it was not superseded. And so basically all this stuff we still need is written into a new file and always appended at the end. And finally, it does a commit. And now we know we are finished. We have all we need. And it's really on disk. And even the RAID controller cache was notified to flush all, all his stuff onto disk. And then we can risk deleting the old stuff. So now we are at the bottom of the graphics. And now it basically deletes all these old segments. And you see, we never modified anything in place. We just wrote new stuff at the end and deleted stuff we don't need anymore. And this is basically how Borg works all the time here in this special uh, example of compacting. A normal backup works similarly, but it's way easier because it just appends at the end all the time and has not to delete something old. So um, are there questions? I'll have a look in the chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. The deduplication is also done client side uh, because the, the client uh, has uh, a local um, index of all chunks and it's a hash table and it's kept in memory. So basically the client knows uh, what's in the repository and whatnot. And it's also quite fast because it's just a hash table lookup. So it's basically O1 operation it does not uh, take longer if your repository grows bigger at least not significantly longer so the data application is all on the on the client side uh, one thing that happens on the server side um, if you say boy check uh, there is a low level check of the repository where you basically just 
uh, recreates the repository index and checks if the CRC32 checksums are okay. This check is uh, happening on the server side just to avoid lots of traffic traffic uh, going over the internet. Uh, but everything else, creating new archives uh, and so on, is, is happening on the client side. Everything that basically needs a cryptographic key is, is happening only on the client. Any other questions about uh, segment files or how the repository works? Okay, Carlines is talk is typing. Is it advisable to input uncompressed? Um, yeah, that depends. Um, of course, if the data is already compressed, uh, you basically cannot expect to compress it again. Uh, the deduplication, um, that, that's basically a matter of how it is compressed. Uh, sometimes you have archive formats and compression formats that are so-called R-syncable. And maybe with that kind of formats, uh, deduplication and chunking somehow works, um, but maybe not as good as on the plain text. And Borg has a so-called uh, auto compressor uh, that first does uh, LZ4 to detect if it's compressible. And if that cannot compress anything, then basically it gives up and just stores the stuff as it is. And if LZ4 basically predicts a good compressibility, then it might use an expensive compressor to try to really compress it. This is this auto mode of compression. Yeah, and you can combine it with uh, Z standard uh, higher levels or with LZMA or so. I personally uh, like LZ4 and Z standard most because these are the most modern compression algorithms. Uh, the LZMA stuff and the uh, Zlib stuff is rather for compatibility reasons and because the Python standard lib has it anyway. Uh, so we still uh, include it. Okay, so I will go on to some frequently asked questions. It's getting a bit less uh, graphical now. <laughs> uh, so this is basically just stuff that comes up again and again. One of the usual questions is, is uh, shall I have one rep big repository and put everything inside that or should I have multiple repository or maybe even many repositories? And there are pros and cons for both. Uh, the pros for one repository basically is, of course, you can get a multi-duplication. If you have a lot of systems and content and files are duplicated because it's the operating system or because you have the same data on multiple machines, of course, you can get better deduplication if you put everything into one repository. Also, you have to have to manage fewer repositories. You have fewer keys to back up. Always have a backup of your uh, bulk passphrase and your bulk key, because if you use the uh, if you lose the passphrase or the key, you can't use your repository anymore because of the encryption. And uh, the the pros for multiple repositories is, of course, there is a bit less risk. If you partition your data into multiple repositories, uh, the damage is smaller if in case one of these repositories gets corrupt somehow. Um, then you just have less data in that one repository and every other repository is maybe still fine. Uh, also, you could do more parallel operations. Uh, Borg is locking the repository if it's uh, doing a backup or if, if it's mounted or so. So if you have everything in one big repository, that repository will be locked a lot of the time 
and because of check operations and backups maybe take rather long in that case um, you maybe could run into a problem because because it's always locked because something is using it and you have a lot of repositories uh, some of them will not be locked and you can work with them uh, I mentioned before that uh, Borg has uh, hash tables in memory to know basically which chunks we already have and which not. And if you have everything in one big repository, of course, all your chunks will be in there. And there will be really many of them because it's all your data. And then it will use a lot of memory if you have everything in one. If you have rather smaller repositories, it will use less memory because the chunk count will be lower. Also, if you happen to be to uh, want a repository check, of course, if the repository is smaller, the check will be finished uh, sooner. And also, if you have other expensive operations like recompress everything or so, if you have one big repo, that will take a lot of time. And if you have multiple smaller, you can basically better manage that. Same thing is access management. Uh, there is not much um, uh, access management going on in Borg. Basically, you either have access to a repository or you don't. And if you have a lot of repositories, you can uh, control this by SSH keys in your authorized keys file. And if you have everything in one repository, of course, you can either grant access to everything or deny access to everything. So it's less flexible with one repository. Um, another thing I did not uh, write onto the slide, if you have one repo and if you back up a lot of clients into that one repository, um, you will also have a lot of uh, resyncing happening on the client side because basically client B is modifying the repository behind client A's back. And later if client A runs again, it will notice that the repository is newer than the local cache state. And then you basically have a cache coherency problem. And Borg will notice this and just update the local cache. But this will take a bit of time. And if you have separate repositories, you can save that time. So let's see if there are questions. Uh, yeah, the repository cloning uh, is just the next slide now. Yes. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's a frequent question. So uh, a lot of people want basically to have a local bulk repository in their company or at home or whatever. And then they want to have another copy in the cloud somewhere. And so usually they use either rsync or R clone to make a copy. And what logically happens, the, the client data basically is back up by Borg into a repository one. And then you use rsync or R clone to basically have a copy of this repository one. I just made this uh, a mark there. Um, and the pros of this approach is the target requirements are rather low. So basically, if you have a machine and there is rsync on it, you don't need to install Borg on it. You already have rsync maybe. Uh, also, you need less time uh, on the client. So there is only one Borg run here. And then the other thing will basically copy your local repository server to the cloud repository server. So the client is only doing a backup once. So these are basically the pros. Uh, the, the problem with this is you have a long chain of operations here and you might have an error propagation. So if your repository one has a problem because there is maybe a file system issue or something or the repository gets corrupted somehow, you are basically making a copy of that corruption and then you have your co corruption twice. And then that's maybe not what you wanted. So I like the, the bottom approach better. Uh, you just run Borg multiple times on the client and you just have multiple repositories somewhere. 
They can be local, they can be at a friend, they can be at some bulk provider, but you just always come from the source and always do a bulk backup. But the, is the, the pro for this is, yeah. Is there basically two backups? Yeah, it's just two backups, two different ah, okay. targets. And the pro of this, this is really independent. So for example, if the, the first bulk backup to repo one had some strange issue, your memory bit flipped or whatever, yeah, lightning, uh, cosmic rays or something, then maybe your repository one is not okay afterwards. But if you just do another backup, it is completely independent of this and maybe this repo two will be completely okay. And then if you notice, okay, I have a problem in repo one somehow, you can just do, use your repo too and you are fine. If you use the 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 top appro uh, the the upper approach, uh, then you will basically just copy the error from repo one to the cloud and you will have the error twice. Another issue is, um, as I mentioned, bulk uses encryption, AES encryption with counter mode. So just imagine you use the upper approach and you have made the backup to repository one. And uh, then basically your repository machine uh, crashes and you basically want your repository back and you use this repository in the cloud to restore it. So you basically copy everything in the other direction and then you will run into a problem because Borg will notice that repo one was newer then your copy in the cloud because you, you did one more backup to that and did not copy it yet to the cloud. And then Borg will basically warn you that there is something strange going on because the counter is basically going backwards. And a uh, counter going backwards is something that must never happen with AES counter mode because uh, if you do this and if an attacker attacks you, basically you you, uh, he could basically break your crypt cryptography. So Borg is warning about this, you can deal with it. If you are not attacked, it's no real problem, but it's somehow an inconvenience that you get strange warnings uh, with that uh, upper approach. Uh, also, some people have the fear uh, that Borg is super expensive and that Ausing gets much, much cheaper. And uh, that might not be really the case. It's it's for sure the case for the first backup because Borg does a lot of stuff. It does encryption, it does compression, it does authentication. So that's rather heavy. But if you are doing your normal ba daily backup and you only have a little bit data more than on the last day, then it's not that expensive. It might be finished in one minute or in one hour or whatever. It will not run for days. So maybe this less time needed of the async approach is not that uh, important if you have a normal daily run of Borg. So let's see, is there more for this? Yeah, are the, is the repository copying stuff? Are there questions for this? Uh, also, uh, a bit of a problem with rsync approach. Uh, of course, you must be a bit careful that whatever you back up with Borg or whatever you rsync with rsync is really a state you want to have back. So, for example, if you do both at the same time, uh, you will basically uh, rsync an inconsistent state of the repository because it has not committed yet and you need to synchronize these two processes. It's no problem, there is a bulk with lock. You can use this for synchronization, but it's something to keep in mind. And uh, also you basically have to monitor whether your rsync really completed uh, uh, operating or if, it, if uh, your state on the cloud side is basically something only partially synchronized. Uh, snapshots uh, can also help with all this stuff. So basically you can do a snapshot and have a consistent state to 
uh, bar equal to L sync. So there's some snapshot talking. Yeah. So basically, uh, what I want to say is basically maybe first try this uh, lower approach before you uh, go to the or try the upper one because it's maybe not that bad as you might imagine. And so just try if it's fast enough. Okay, so continue. Uh, about chunkers, uh, this is one component of Borg, basically cutting the input file into pieces because the data application of Borg is not based on the whole file, but on pieces of the file. The only exception is if your whole file is rather tiny, like one kilobyte or so, it will be below the lower limit of the chunker, and then one file will be one chunk. But if you have bigger files, a file is usually uh, multiple chunks. Uh, Borg has two different chunkers. One is called a bus hash chunker. It's a specific a uh, rolling hash chunking algorithm and uh, the the stuff this is implementing is called content defined chunking so the chunking place where it cuts the file into pieces is defined by the content so you will look through the content there will be a small window moving over your whole file in one byte steps and then it will compute this rolling hash over the data inside the window and mask it with a bit mask. And if that results into zero, then it will cut a chunk. So the chunking is completely driven basically by the content seen at a specific place in the file. And this has a nice property. If your content is moving inside the file because you are prepending something, into the file or inserting a megabyte of data in the middle of a file. Uh, most of the chunks will move, but the content of uh, the whole rest of the file will stay the same maybe. And then the bus hash chunker will cut the same chunks if it runs into the, the uh, part of the file that was not modified. And so this is a quite nice uh, chunking algorithm Basically, if you have content moving its position inside a file. Also, it's somehow efficient because this rolling hash uh, is easy to update. So if your window advances position by one byte, it only basically has to do two small correction operations to compute a new hash value. It does not have to compute the whole uh, hash again. So it's it's relatively fast. But still, it's expensive if you compare it to the fixed chunker. The fixed chunker is super simple. It just cuts at positions. So for example, if you say, I want to have uh, one megabyte large pieces, it will cut at one megabyte position. It will cut at two megabyte position inside a file. It will cut at three megabyte position. So this is super easy. And of course, it's even uh, lighter on the CPU that this, than this uh, other one. You can use this fixed chunker if you have a block device. Uh, usually a lot of content stays at the same place. Or if you are cutting a LVM logical volume into logical extents. Or maybe even if you have a database and it's a rather simple kind of database and it has just fixed record size, you can maybe even cut such a database into records or into pieces of 100 records or whatever. So here is how to configure this. Uh, if you make a backup, you use this ball create call, and this has one option of chunker params. And then you basically just tell uh, Borg which kind of parameters you would like. Uh, the syntax I used here is basically the Borg 1.2 syntax. If you use uh, Borg 1.1, you don't need to specify this bus hash stuff because it only has one algorithm anyway. So you only need the numbers. Starting with Borg 1.2, you will have to add the algorithm you want. And then you can also use the other one. And then you have to add uh, just some numbers like this. And uh, this is, looks like uh, weird, but it's quite simple. 
you basically just give the minimum chunk size, you give the maximum chunk size, and you give the target chunk size. And it's always uh, powers of two. So if you tell 19 here, it will be two to the power of 19. That equals a half a megabyte. And the maximum size is two to the power of 23. That's eight megabytes. And the target size is two to the power of 21. This is two megabytes. So if you have a big file that's way larger than two megabytes, usually your chunks might be around two megabytes. It's of course depending on the content. So it can also be quite smaller. It can also be quite larger, but not larger than eight and not smaller than half a megabyte. And this window size, uh, just keep it like it is. Uh, this is from the algorithm. I'm not sure if it makes sense to modify this. I never did this, so just keep it, that works. And so basically what you get if you use these parameters are rather large chunks. And large chunks means not many chunks. And not many chunks means low management overhead. Your hash tables won't be that big because you don't have many chunks. If you use this next example, this will cut rather small chunks. You see the target size is 64 kilobytes. The smallest chunks it will give you might be one kilobyte and the largest chunk might be still eight megabyte. But the target is about 64 kilobytes, not two megabytes. And you can, you can estimate if you have primarily large files, then 64 kilobytes compared to two megabytes will give you about 32 times as many chunks as the upper approach. So we'll, you will have a lot of small chunks. And of course, you need to manage them. So you will have a high management overhead, meaning you will need, need a lot of memory and also a bit more disk space. Uh, the fixed chunk is even easier. You basically just tell it, use the fixed algorithm. This is new in Borg 1.2. Borg 1.1 does not know this yet. And then you just tell the, the block size uh, here in this example, like uh, four megabytes. And then it will just cut at position four megabyte, at position eight megabyte, and so on. Super simple. Uh, I added one nice little feature. The first block can be different size. For example, if this is kind of a header in some uh, inside some file, like four kilobyte header followed by 64 kilobyte blocks, then you can use these parameters to cut it into the respective blocks. This is super fast, super low CPU usage. And if your content does not shift inside a file, then you can use this. Uh, the usual pitfalls with chunking is uh, some people try to optimize for the best duplication, deduplication. And of course, if you want to have the best deduplication, then you want to have small chunks. This is uh, nice to have, but if you have a, a lot of data, you will need a lot of memory also. And loading the chunks into index into memory when Borg is starting up also will need a bit more time because it has to load a, a lot of data from disk. And if you use big chunks, of course, the deduplication will be worse because one byte change inside such a big chunk will create a different chunk. So it will deduplicate uh, worse because of the granularity but you will have fewer chunks and you will need less memory and also less disk space. You basically have to find uh, for your application and matching to your machine uh, what works best for you. The default of Borg, by the way, uh, is this upper approach. The, the lower parameters on this page used to be used for very early Borg versions and for Etic. But people complained a lot because they ran into out of memory problems when they tried this on their Raspberry Pi. So yeah, this basically is it. And also keep in mind that little files always create one chunk 
So um, the estimation might be rather on the lower end. In practice, it will usually be more than you estimate. So let's see if there are questions about chunking. <laughs> yeah, fix this better if business model is selling disk space. <laughs> and also, um, not only fixed, but also uh, if you use ra rather large chunks, even with the bus hash chunker. Um, the fixed size chunker has not necessarily a disadvantage with small changes. It depends on how big your fixed size is. If you say my fixed size is one kilobyte, you have a very small granularity. And then you will have a great deduplication as long as your stuff is not moving inside the file. But the problem is if you use a very tiny chunk size, you will have lots and lots of chunks to manage. So you can do this if your overall data size is not that big. But if you have many, many terabytes of files, maybe rather don't use tiny chunks. I think that's also a problem, by the way, if you use ZFS. If you use ZFS deduplication, I think you will also need quite a lot of memory. It's for the same reason it needs to manage all these uh, pieces somehow. But with ZFS, the deduplication is taken into account on the file system side, so on the backup server, and not on your client. Yeah. But uh, indeed, the ZFS overhead for doing the duplication is enormous. Yeah. Do you know the block size ZFS is using for the uh, duplication? It's also variable. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so it will use smaller uh, for for more for smaller smaller sizes and bigger for bigger sizes. But it oh. it creates it creates a hash table of blocks. So oh. basically, sort of the same as uh, Borg does. Oh, okay. So then, if you use fixed fixed chunks, you get a higher yield from your ZFS deduplication. Oh, okay. Okay, I think that was it about the chunking, so I'll continue. So uh, this is basically internal stuff of Borg, but maybe at some time it might be useful for you if you know what's what's going on. Uh, so the Borg client um, has a local chunk index. It's it's in the home directory of the, the, the Borg user or of the user using Borg. Um, and the chunk index basically maps the ID of the chunk. So basically the, the key of the key value store is mapped into the refer onto the reference count, onto the size of that piece of data and the compressed size of that piece of data. And this index is uh, in a hash table and it's basically used in Borg to have a presence detection. Do we already have this chunk or do we not have it yet? Also, if you are deleting data, Borg, of course, uh, must keep the chunk as long as some archive is referencing it. It only can be deleted if the reference counter goes to zero. But in that case, of course, it should be deleted to not uh, take um, disk space. So basically, presence detection, garbage collection, statistics. Uh, this is why Borg's, Borg has this chunk index on the client side. And this is also avoiding round trips. So it does not have to ask the server, do you already have this chunk? Because that would always mean a round trip over the internet potentially. It has a hash table in memory. It's super fast. It's all one access time. And it basically knows what it has. On the repository side, there is also a hash table that maps the chunk ID, the key, to the segment and the offset. In this uh, Borg compact example, you have seen the segment files. Segment files have just the number as a file name. And inside the file, there are usually multiple chunks 
So if you want to know where is my chunk, you need a segment number, the file name basically, and you need an offset inside that file. And then you have direct access uh, to all these chunks that are distributed over these files. It's also kept in memory if the Borg self process is running. So also super fast um, and it basically knows where the stuff is. Uh, about these indexes, uh, you can lose them. It's no big issue. Uh, the repository index can be rebuilt from segment files. It will just create a completely new index. And also this chunks index uh, can be rebuilt from archive information. Uh, the only bad thing is that rebuild will take some time, of course, depending on the size of your repository and depending on the count of archives inside your repository. All this indexing stuff is implemented in C for speed reasons and also for memory consumption reasons. And this stuff resides in main memory while Borg is running. And as I already mentioned, smaller chunks means more chunks means more memory usage. Uh, there is one additional trick you maybe should know. Uh, Borg has one directory, it's called chunks.archive.d. You will find it inside uh, the cache directory in the home directory. And uh, there it is keeping per archive chunk indexes. And these are useful if Borg ever needs to uh, rebuild its local chunk index. So there is one index, it's also sometimes called the master chunk index. And basically this master index can be reassembled from per archive chunk indexes. If this is all using local files, this is rather fast. So you have a fast way, but of course you need to uh, give it the space on the client. So if you, for example, have a small, very small root file system and Borg runs as root, uh, this might be a problem because Borg is using rather lots of space inside this directory. And if you ever run into a problem with this, and if you prefer the slow way, you can just rm-rf this chunks archive D directory and then replace it by an empty file with touch. And then it, Borg won't be able to create a directory right there. It's a quite dirty trick, but it works. Borg can cope with this. And if you use this slow way, then of course, there is no local cache with per archive chunk indexes. So Borg, if it has to resync the master index, it will fetch all the data from the remote side. So the good thing is less space. The bad thing is if it needs to resync, it will be slower. So you can basically choose uh, space versus time as usual. Uh, I just seen another question about a chunking. Uh, there is no easy way inside Borg to calculate the best fitting chunk size. You basically have to try and it very much depends on the content of your data. Uh, you can, if, if your software lets you choose, uh, basically you can try not to sprinkle changes, little changes over big files but always append them at the end. But uh, a lot of software gives you no choice. If you do database dumps, some databases I think uh, give you a choice. So basically if you can have uh, your database dump somehow sorted, like older stuff at the beginning and newer stuff at the end, that would be a good idea. A better idea than having basically it uh, uh, sorted by by name or something or random order. Okay, anything about this caching stuff? I don't think so. Some people are typing still. Uh, base, uh, also, uh, if you run into a space problem with this directory, you can also use a symlink and just symlink it to a place where you have more storage. So that's also an uh, alternative solution. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's by the way, all this stuff is in the documentation, so um, you can also read the docs. <laughs> Uh, the server is not recalculating hashes because it has no way to do this. Um, the, the hash bulk is computing over the plain text data. It's not like SHA-256 or something. It's a keyed hash and you use a, uh, you need a secret key to com correctly compute this hash. And uh, the server does not even have that key. So there is no way for the server to, to recompute something like that. Okay, some people leaving. Okay, let's continue. Uh, another cache Borg is using is the files cache. And what it does is basically another mapping. Uh, this time is not, uh, it is not using the, the key for the key value store, but it, using, it is using the full path of the file. So all directories up to the root and uh, ending with the file name. And for space reasons, this is only a memory usage optimization. It's computing a hash over this. It's not important. You can just imagine the full path is the key. And the value is the size, the change time, the inode number, and a list of chunk IDs. Basically, Borg, when it does a backup, it is remembering the stuff it is currently backing up into in this file's cache. And if you do the next backup, then it will basically just do a stat on the on the file it's currently processing. And it will also do this lookup into this files cache uh, to basically uh, get the, the information out of the cache. So you basically have file system state and you have cached state. And then there might be uh, different outcomes of this lookup. There might be a cache miss. So this lookup in the cache basically says, I don't have anything about it. Then you have a new file or you have a renamed file. So your full path key has changed somehow. Then Borg needs to read and chunk the file and just process it basically as a new file. And it will also remember this new file into the files cache. It could also be that you have a cache hit. So there is some information in the cache about this full path, but uh, the value in the cache, the, the size, the change time, the inode is different from what you have seen in the file system now. So you know, okay, that file obviously has changed somehow. Then basically you process it like a new file. You read it, you chunk it, you do everything needed. And the best case is you have a hit in the cache and size, change time and inode all match, then you can be very, very sure that a file is not changed. And this is the reason why Borg is so fast if most of your files did not change, because it only has to do a stat and a hash table lookup, and then it can know basically this file did not change. And then there, there is no reason even to open the file or to, to read the file contents, because it knows already the file has not changed. And you see it's the chunk IDs are also in the cache. So then with, it will just use these cached chunk IDs and make a new entry in the archive it is currently creating. And the only thing it needs to read from the file system are uh, BSD style flags, extended attributes, ACLs, and so. But it does not have to read any content uh, from the file. And this is the, the main reason for Borg's rather high speed for unchanged files. Um, there are some uh, pitfalls with this. So basically what you have to remember is the full path is the key in this cache. And the value is some kind of timestamp. You can choose whether this is the change time or the modification time the inode number and the size. And it's getting really fast if all that stuff is matching. So if you want to have fast backups, uh, be careful with mount points. So for example, if you have snapshots, always mount a snapshot to the same mount point if you want to use Borg on the snapshot. 
then you will have the same full path and your files cache will be happy and work. Also avoid stuff like uh, change mode, change owner, change group. Uh, some people have such stuff in a cron job and do are doing a vast amount of metadata changes in the file system just to fix up some stuff. And of course, if you do that, your change time will change and then you will have a cache miss and your backup will be slower than uh, than needed. Uh, also uh, a point, this, is also, this applies for change times and also for M times. For M times, the problem can be that some user space tools are fooling around with the M time, for example, image processing tools. Basically, they open the image, change the content of the image, write it back, and then write the old M time back. So basically, you have the, the, the previous M time still. And then, of course, uh, Borg won't notice that this file has changed. So then you might lose data. So the M time is expected to really change if the file has been modified. That's the reason, by the way, why M time is not a default anymore. Borg is using C time by default because this is under kernel control and the user cannot fool around with it. But if you use M time, be careful. There are tools fooling around with it. And another pitfall is the inode number. Uh, it should be stable because then Borg also can be rather sure the file did not change. But if you back up network file systems shares, these often do not have stable inode numbers. Uh, then you might uh, uh, have to remove this inode from this parameter. You can also run Borg without inode checking here. So these are basically the tricks to have uh, a really fast backup and to tweak it. So let's see if there is a question. Is there a way to force ignore M times and C times? Yes, uh, but you need to have something uh, to do this detection. Uh, I recently added a feature one guy wanted to have to only use the size as the only indication of unchanged files. This is of course very dangerous because you can change a file without changing its size. You just have to make some A into a B and this does not change the size, but it changes the content. But in some applications, you might be sure that if a change is there, also the size will change. So I added these features with a warning only use this if you know what you are doing, but usually you want to check the C time because this is a rather safe method. Uh, you can also skip the files cache completely. You can say files cache equals none, uh, but then Borg will open every file and chunk it and check if it already has that chunk. So it will be rather slow and do a lot of IO. Uh, the memory footprint is rather complicated. So basically on the server side, it's the repository index. Uh, there is a formula in the documentation. It's basically amount of chunks times the size of a hash table entry. Uh, for details, have a look in the, in the documentation. It's the, the formula is there. Uh, it's a bit hard to estimate because uh, hash tables also need to keep a specific amount of free space inside a hash table. So if the hash table grows, it will always grow by a specific amount and not only by one entry or so. But for a rough approximation, you can use that formula. And on the client side, there is this uh, chunks index and also the files cache. Uh, both also depend on the amount of chunks. And the files cache depends, of course, on the amount of files you have. Yeah, uh, for, for not extreme cases and for what I call a balanced system, it's usually no problem. Just if you have terabytes of stuff connected to your old Raspberry Pi, then you might have a problem because some of these devices only have one a half of a gigabyte or so. And that might be not enough in such a case. Okay, anything else? 
Okay, I think that was it. So let's see what we have else. Yeah, here's uh, some spe specific stuff about the files cache uh, memory needs. Because some people really have a ton of small files and then the files cache can grow rather large. And it's not only in memory, it's also on disk because the files cache is persisted on disk. And you can use these two environment variables to tune it. There is one thing called bulk files cache TTL, like time to live. Uh, it basically means if a file has not been seen for n times, then it will be removed from the cache. Because at some times you have to kick out uh, old entries, you can't keep them forever. And uh, you can tweak this value, it has a default of 20. But if you know for sure that you're that you only have one data set you back up on a specific uh, machine, then you could even li uh, live with a TTL of one or two, maybe. Uh, you just have to avoid that if you have it lower than you need. And this depends on the amount of data sets. For example, if you have a system and you do a, a system backup into one archive and a home directory backup into another archive, both with, with the same Borg, both with the same user. And then this means basically you have two data sets you back up. And then you must not go below a TTL of two because otherwise you would lose your old files cache and then you would not have one in the next run. So don't go lower than your amount of data sets. Uh, and there's another trick, uh, bulk files cache suffix. It's basically just splitting this uh, one piece of cache into multiple by just adding a file name extension. So if you have this job that does the system backup, you could basically use a suffix of dot system or something. And if you have the home directory backup, you could use a suffix of uh, dot home. And then basically this one big cache would be split into two separate files. And the one bulk create job would only load the one cache and the other bulk job would only load the other cache. So you can basically reduce the in-memory um, uh, size of the cache because you only load what you need for this kind of archive creation. Uh, how is the time? I think we are rather late, right? Yeah. Well, we already announced that we were not going to uh, press for time. So take <laughs> your time. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is something um, that's rather curious, but some people stumble over it again and again. It's in the FAQ section of the documentation, but I thought I'd point it out shortly. Uh, this is basically uh, a thing caused by the granularity of the timestamps in the file system. So you know some crappy file systems go up to two seconds granularity. Uh, decent file systems are usually something like microseconds or even nanoseconds or so. So um, this is rather an, uh, an exotic case on a decent file system, but it can be a severe thing if your file system is rather crappy and old. So just imagine your newest input file has changed at time t. Then you do a snapshot using your file system snapshot tool or LVM or whatever. And the snapshot is, is done in the same uh, granularity as t. So basically the snapshot is also happening at time t. Then you change a file again also in the same granularity t. So it's all the same timestamp. And then you do a bulk backup uh, of the snapshot. And the files cache then of course will remember that the file has times timestamp t. Later you do another backup and because the file changed again in the, with the same timestamp. The file system now has a timestamp T, but the file content is different than in the archive. But because the timestamp is always T, Boyd will think that the file is not changed. 
because the, the cache timestamp is the same as the file system timestamp. And to, to avoid data loss in this case, because Borg would not back up this file, uh, Borg is leaving out the files with the newest timestamp. They are not written into the files cache. So if you are backing only backing up only a single file, of course, this single file will be the file with the newest timestamp and it will be not in the file system cache. And if this happens to be a very big file and you do the next Borg backup, then Borg will not find it in the files cache and it will read it and chunk it all over again. So it will be rather slow. And if you want to optimize this away, just do a touch onto some dummy file and also back up this dummy file. So the dummy file will be the file with the newest timestamp. And then you are fine. Then the big file will have an older timestamp and Borg will not think it has to do a lot of effort to avoid data loss. Was this <laughs> clear enough or is it confusing? I'm not sure by the way, um, how much this really is a problem in practice because uh, of course doing snapshots and that stuff uh, usually takes some time. But uh, yeah, it's just a matter of caution and uh, the code was already there in ETIC. So uh, the ETIC author thought it is an issue, uh, but not sure how, how uh, relevant to practice this really is. Okay, let's continue. What else do we have? Uh, yeah, one thing dealing with defects. Um, as you have seen, Borg does really a lot of checksumming and uh, checksumming is uh, on the low level is CRC32. So usually good enough to uh, find some accidental corruption, but it also does a lot of cryptographic checksumming and computing message authentication codes. And these are really strong so this is 256 bits of cryptographic hash. This really finds everything. So if one bit is flipping somewhere, Borg will detect it. And the, the problem is uh, Borg will often be the first thing detecting it. Uh, if you just copy a file around, you maybe won't even notice that the file is corrupted. Uh, but Bolt will will always notice it. If you extract it and there is something wrong, uh, you will get an integrity error or something. Uh, the usual case, if something like that uh, is appearing in our issue tracker, I recommend the people to run Memtest 68 uh, plus uh, or something similar, and also maybe do a long test on their disk or SSD. Uh, just to make sure that the hardware is working correctly. Because usually if Borg finds an integrity error, it is the hardware. It's rather rare that there is a Borg bug. It only happened once yet. This was in 1.1.11. And then the procedure is of course, first uh, look for defect hardware, then replace the hardware, and then maybe run Borg check repair on it. Don't run a repair run on defect hardware because you might make stuff even worse by doing this. And Boyd Check tries to be careful not to destroy your data, but there might be strange effects uh, if your hardware is really malfunctioning severely, especially if it's in memory, then everything is possible basically. So first fix the hardware, then run Boyd Check. Yeah, that basically uh, was it. So let's see if there are questions. Yeah, good tip, uh, use ECC uh, memory, uh, then at least a single uh, bit errors are automatically corrected and uh, more heavy errors are at least noticed and the machine is halted. Uh, the worst stuff is if it's mem if it's corrupting inside memory and then basically persisting that corruption onto disk. That's the the worst stuff. Um, Mark asks, is there no automatic checking on files in the repository? Uh, as long as you don't touch them, nobody checks it. 
Uh, but of course, if you use Borg extract or Borg mount and, and read stuff from the repository, then it will check again if the message authentication code is okay. So in that case, it will, will check stuff. Uh, but if you want to just do a man monthly check or something, you can either use Borg check or you could use uh, also Borg extract dry run. So not really extract, write stuff to disk, but do everything else except writing it to disk. Uh, if you do the repository only check, you can run it on the server. I mean, so directly run it on the server like a cron job on the server, because for the repository check, you don't need a cryptographic key. Uh, if you also want to do the higher level checks like the archives checking, then of course you need the cryptographic key because the archives and all this metadata stuff is all encrypted. So the server usually does not have the key. So it's not able to do that check. And uh, by the way, if you run the check from the client and just say boy check without special options, it will do both checks. But uh, if you run a client server mode, the repository checking part will run locally on the server. So not much will go over the network. And only the archives check then will transfer a lot of, lots of metadata over the network. And uh, also a frequent question is how often uh, one wants to run Borg check. But I think there is no simple answer. This depends a lot on how reliable your hardware is and also on about how important your data is. So if your hardware feels a bit crappy, maybe, maybe run it rather often. If your hardware feels rather stable, you could, could run it once a year or once every few months or so. Uh, it's a matter of taste mostly. Yeah, Mark noticed uh, you can also run bulk check only on the last few archives. So you basically don't tell it just bulk check and it will check all the archives, but you can say, I think minus minus last three or something, uh, then it will only look at the last three archives. Uh, no, I don't have a broken hardware uh, test bed. Uh, I do a lot of testing in Vagrant machines, uh, but I do not simulate hardware errors. So it's always a good idea to have some decent hardware and file system like ZFS uh, and maybe not run it on too, too crappy file systems or controllers or stuff. Because what you have to keep in mind, it's a deduplicating backup. So you have every piece of data only once. So you can make 1000 archives, but still every piece of data will be there only once. So you would really want to avoid to lose any of those chunks. And that's also the reason why you maybe want to have two independent backups to different targets, just in case some file gets lost or so because one lost chunk can maybe affect 100 archives if, if you are unlucky. Uh, yeah, there's a mention of Borgmatic. Uh, Borgmatic is the tool basically that puts a configuration file on top of Borg. So if you don't like to have own scripts with a lot of options, you can have just have a Borgmatic configuration file and configure everything else there. And then Borgmatic will basically run Borg for you. Uh, I can't tell too much about Borgmatic. I don't use it personally. I rather write my own scripts. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's also, uh, there are multiple graphical tools. Uh, one I already mentioned is Volta. It's QT based. And there is also another one called Pika Backup. 
uh, another sort of uh, graphical interface. By the way, also a good idea is not only to use ECC memory, but also to have a decent mirroring of your disks, like for example by ZFS, because uh, if you happen to have some sort of corruption on one magnetic disk, then ZFS will basically know which data is correct and which data is not correct. It does not have to rely on some error message from the disk or from the rate controller or something, but because ZFS is also doing cryptographic hashes, it can basically see if this data is correct and the other side is not correct and then do the right thing. If you only have one disk or some crappy rate system, uh, you might run in into problems if the detection is not uh, working correctly. Yeah, and you can even save the money for a rate controller because ZFS doesn't like it anyway. And also the pain of using different rate controller tools. Every manufacturer does his own thing. That's quite a lot of better if you just use ZFS. Uh, JBot is not a way, is the way to go. Can you explain this? Ah, you mean the, the rate controller mode, yeah. So, so not have a real rate controller, but just have a controller with a lot of interfaces and JBot mode. Okay, yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think we are at the end if there are no questions anymore. So thank you for listening. Uh, the state of Borg 1.2 uh, is basically late beta and soon a release candidate, I think this might be the next release I'm doing. It will be a release candidate of 1.2. And yeah, stuff that's not in yet, then we'll have to wait a bit. But you can soon test it. And if you have some space and time, you basically can even test the, the beta version of it. Just don't use it for your production backups yet. Just do another backup with it, an additional backup basically. Uh, migration will be rather easy because most stuff is just compatible, so no big pain points there. And you can even run 1.1 uh, on the server and 1.2 on the client. That should also work without problems. Uh, yeah, uh, Jonas is asking about the locking, what could be done in, in parallel, basically, and, and whatnot. Um, this is a, a long-term topic. Uh, the, the problem is it's, it's not very easy because uh, some stuff is writing to the repository, maybe where it's not, not, not clear by the operation itself. And um, uh, early Borg versions had a bit final locking than it's now. Now it's rather simple, just lock it and it's it's basically a hard lock. Um, earlier versions had basically some kind of, of soft lock and hard lock combined, but that code only led to, um, to deadlocks because the lock upgrading and downgrading led, led to issues. And because of that, we, we simplified it. And yeah, this is basically on the to-do list for some time to optimize that, but that will uh, need lots of code review and what we can do and what we can't. Uh, there is a little dirty trick that's already available, but uh, use it on your own risk. Um, there was one use case uh, of somebody who had basically a Borg repository on a read-only uh, media, like a Blu-ray disc or something. 
And because Borg wants to create a lock inside a repository, then you have a problem. If the repository is read only, you can't create a lock inside there. And uh, I added some option. I don't remember the name exactly, but it's basically ignore locking. And then Borg lets you basically do the operation you want to do without locking it. In case of read-only media, it's no problem anyway, because you can change the content of the repository. You can just read it. Um, and so that is basically a way to avoid locking. But of course, you can also use it to shoot it into your food, uh, because if you avoid locking and if you are writing, uh, then you can run into problems. Okay, some people are typing. <laughs> yeah, you too. Live long and prosper. <laughs> uh, by the way, the name of the backup software was also uh, uh, a discussion in the ticket. <laughs> Uh, combining backup PC with Borg, uh, it's nothing I personally tried, but I think somebody mentioned it is in, in the issue tracker at some time, but I, I can't remember the details. In general, Borg on Windows is a bit of a problem because there are no persistent maintainers and sometimes people show up, do a bit and vanish again. But uh, there is a lot to do, and there should be more people and maybe more persistent people uh, working on that kind of stuff. Uh, because Windows file system and Windows process stuff is quite different than on Linux. Uh, what you can already do is uh, run Borg under Windows subsystem for Linux. And also Borg under Cygwin more, works more or less. But yeah, be careful with that. Uh, you can back up a Windows share, of course. Uh, for example, use a ZIFS mount or something. Uh, but we also found bugs in ZIFS mount by doing that. Um, so sometimes there are bugs elsewhere. In general, Borg will be happy if your file system is working. And that is uh, the, the input file system with your source data as well as the target file system with the repository. If the file systems are working normally, then Borg does not have a problem with it, no matter what it is. But sometimes file systems are just crappy or just taking away open file descriptors and stuff, and uh, then it sometimes gets problematic. Especially the so-called cloud file systems are sometimes rather badly implemented. Local file systems usually work OK and network file systems are somehow in the middle between local and cloud. Yeah. So advice, taking a file system snapshot and backupping that. Yeah, I mentioned that in one of my slides. If you make a snapshot to back it up, that's a good idea because Borg does no, no special stuff about consistency. It just backups whatever it can read from the uh, path you give it. And you basically have to care that whatever Borg reads from there is in a state that you want to have backed up. So if, you're, if your file system is very hot and changing all the time, you maybe don't want to back it up that way. Then you do a snapshot, so you have at least a crash consistent state, and then you back up the snapshot. And the only special thing you have to remember is uh, mount the backup, uh, mount the snapshot always to the same mount point. So don't have some timestamp or some unique ID in the mount point, because that will be in that full path, and the full path is remembered in the files cache. And if this full path is always changing, whenever you do a snapshot, then the files cache basically won't work. 
So just do a bind mount maybe, or if you can influence the mount point, just always use the same mount point. It's, it's just a speed thing, so you won't have corruption or data loss or something. It will also work if you don't do that. But if you want to have it really fast, always use the same full path. Uh, it seems the new inodes make the backup really slow. Um, yeah, I, I don't know enough about the snapshotting mechanisms. Does a snapshot mean the inode number changes? Usually not, right? Okay, so if you have a problem with the inode numbers, you can just uh, use minus minus files cache and just leave away this inode option. Just make sure there is enough left, like C time and size, that that boy can still safely detect the changed file. And you can use LVM, you can use ZFS, you can use whatever you want to snapshot. Uh, Borg is not, not basically interested in that. It's just reading your files and you have to have them in a good state. Uh, of course, if you have, for example, database files, uh, you want to either shut down the database or dump the database, or at least have some some stable state on disk uh, that is somehow consistent. Usually, databases have a mechanism for that. And if you back up um, virtual machines, the safest way, of course, is shut them down and then back them up. Um, the second best is maybe also doing a snapshot and maybe first, uh, how is it pronounced, quiescing the, the file system inside the virtual machine. So basically all processes should write their buffers really uh, to disk. And then you will also see it on the host and you can back that up. Yeah. Um, by the way, I uh, some releases ago, maybe one or two releases I go, uh, I added an option like debugging files cache or so. Uh, it's in the change log. So uh, if you somehow have the impression that Borg is a bit slow for you and does not run over thousands of files in a second, uh, then you can use that option and Borg will explicitly tell you uh, whether it has a files cache hit or a miss and why it why it was a miss basically or why it didn't match and then you will see okay the i know changed or the c time changed you could also do this manually of course by just using stat on your files but if you use that uh, debug option borg will even tell you uh what what's going on uh, yeah, I meanwhile personally use Borg on macOS. Um, and a nice combination is if you use it with Vorta, because uh, Vorta will just sit in your uh, top bar and you can uh, use it also as a scheduler and say, say, okay, every hour, please make a backup, but only if I'm connected to my usual home wireless LAN. Uh, so Vorta is quite nice on the macOS. Uh, it's developer, I think he's also using macOS, so uh, that's quite well tested. And I personally use it on a on a M1 uh, MacBook machine. Meanwhile, so it's even tested on Intel on and on Apple Silicon. So Karl Heinz is still typing, Mark also typing. Yeah, it's of, of course it's not uh, maybe as nicely integrated as Time Machine. So there is no 3D uh, stack of history or something. So it's a bit more simple than Time Machine from the, the GUI uh, stuff, but uh, yeah, 
maybe it has other qualities. Maybe after the talk, some people can uh, tell me about their experiences uh, with Time Machine. I personally never used it, so I can't comment on Time Machine too much. Well, for one thing, Time Machine is not an open source product. Yeah. Does, does it something with crypto or so? I don't know. I don't use Mac because uh, it's not an open source product. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the disk where you write on can be encrypted. So on, on the block layer, basically. Correct. Yeah. So Time Machine itself maybe does nothing with crypto, it just writes stuff. Well, uh, you cannot read uh, your Time Machine on another um, Mac. Huh? You cannot read the Time Machine backup uh, yeah. on another Mac. And if In your Mac case. gets stolen, what do you do then? Uh, you, uh, if you know your passphrase, then you can, but uh, oh, um, okay. and then you can restore from the backup. Full, fully restore, including, including uh, the OS. Okay. If your MacBook gets stolen, that's the perfect time to switch to an open source operating system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm personally using both uh, Linux and macOS now. macOS since a week. Uh, besides the <laughs> issue with not being open source, I quite like it. And especially the, the battery lifetime of this M1 laptop is really great. So usually my batteries are empty first be before the laptop gives up. And I never had that with any um, x86 or x64 uh, machine. So battery is one of the nice things. You have to wait for a RISC-V risk based uh, <laughs> laptop. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so I think we're sort of done. Um, uh, there's one question of Jonas. Uh, ah. Is there a way to use Borg in such a way that you make local backups and sync them to the server when having a connection? Um, Yeah, I think that somehow goes in the direction of this slide with uh, syncing a Borg repository. Uh, there is nothing built into Borg. Of course, you can have a Borg repository on your local disk and, and later sync it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I maybe would rather check the network connection and do the, the, the real backup if, if there is a connection to the right network. And Volta even has a, a, a configuration option for this. So it won't back up over whatever mobile network or so, but it will wait until you are into the right Wi-Fi network. Uh, it is possible to back up a file in use, but that's maybe not what you want <laughs> uh, because it might be not consistent. So yeah. You will just get whatever Borg will read. And if it's not consistent, you will have an inconsistent file. If you do a snapshot, you are a bit better, then you might have consistency. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Borg will, uh, at least in Borg 1.2, Borg will notice if a file has changed while it was backing it up, and it will issue a warning in that case. So it will basically do a stat when starting to back up a file. And when it's finished with the file, it will do another stat. And then it will look at a, a C time, I think, and at um, size and so on. And if the stat values does not match, it will put a warning into your log file. This file has changed while Borg has backed it up. So then you know that there might be a consistency issue. Uh, yeah, there is no shadow copy or something inside Borg. This is always the task of a wrapper script. Uh, because this is very system dependent, Windows has one method, method ZFS has another, ButterFS has another, LVM has another. And yeah, Borg is basically just the core and you have 
to have this snapshotting around it. Okay, so I think we have it. If there are more questions, uh, we have a mailing list, we have an issue tracker, we have a Twitter account, so you can find me. And we are also have an IRC channel, not on Freenode anymore. It's It has moved <laughs> to libera.chat like everybody else. So we can have more discussion there. Perfect. So uh, this uh, concludes the two V event series for mm -hmm. Borg Backup. Perhaps we should do another one in uh, in a year to talk about the changes, just to keep it uh, yeah. in the loop. But uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah. since we have uh, quite some uh, uh, non-Dutch uh, speakers, uh, let me explain how we do these V events. This, uh, uh, there's a sort of the official part which sort of ends now and then there's the unofficial part that can go on for hours where we have <laughs> a, an online drink and just uh, uh, chat about anything related or non-related to the subject of the evening so uh, once again thank you uh, let's uh, uh, take a few minutes to get a drink and then uh, uh, yeah start start talking about the fun things in life <laughs> Sadly, no mate here, but I get another drink. <laughs> yeah, the disadvantage of the mate is that it's a half a liter bottles. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. So will I. Oh, everybody that's leaving now, thank you very much. And uh, have a good evening or a good day. <laughs>